key milestones will be the scoping study, main resource, moving through these studies. That's when the institutional investors have to come in and say, well, hang on, this is going to be a mine again. What are they buying into? What have you said to get a premium like that? Because for them, it's not a lot of money. There's a step change for you potentially in terms of what you can do to unrelease the potential you know, in Vietnam, right? So what have you had to give away? They understand that they're not the only ones and they need to tread carefully. There's not many assets like this left around the globe. Hello, and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like it, give us a thumbs up and do leave your comments below. It really helps us try and understand the sorts of questions and thoughts uh, and ideas that you have with regards to companies and the things that you're looking from from us. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, if you want to see more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to Scott Williamson, who is the MD of Blackstone Minerals. They're an Australian explorer with multiple assets, but they're focusing on their Vietnam Takua uh, nickel asset. Um, they've recently been funded by EcoPro, a Korean industrial partner. Um, this money will allow them to get through to BFS stage, um, at which point they're going to have to make some decisions as to who they continue to partner with and where indeed the funding comes from to develop this out. Because they're looking to get into production within three years. Ambitious target indeed. Can they do it? We'll find out by listening to what Scott has to say. Hello Scott, how are you sir? Good thanks Matt. So uh, where are you in the world at the moment? Yeah, so in uh, the uh, self-isolation mode in, in Perth with my family and, uh, yeah, trying to uh, stay away from the streets and uh, stay safe. Yeah, now we spoke to a couple of guys in Perth uh, yesterday. They said glorious weather, so it's not too bad a place to be holed up, right? Yeah, it's great. Can't be bad. Hey, so you've, um, why don't we kick off the one minute overview and then we'll kind of get into some of the more recent news. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're uh, the uh, Blackstone Minerals. Um, we have a portfolio of battery and precious metals assets across the globe. Our flagship asset is the Takwa Nickel Project in northern Vietnam. Um, that's a previously operating mine, so it operated between 2013 and 2016. Uh, and the previous owners sunk over $130 million into the capital infrastructure. So we, uh, our focus is to bring this mine back into production. Uh, a little bit of a different strategy to our, our, uh, the previous owners of that asset. Um, when we're looking to, um, I suppose, feed this nickel into the lithium ion battery industry. And, uh, and, and we're looking uh, to, I suppose, work with um, strategic partners um, to develop downstream processing and um, which will, uh, I suppose, move this nickel concentrate into a um, pre premium product, which is the nickel sulfate. Or the lithium ion battery industry so yeah looking forward to the next stage of that that process fantastic fantastic um obviously we talked back in november when you were in london for the uh for a conference there um and we sort of went through your you know the, the history and so forth and so people can refer back to that um interview um because you, you had a few other assets around the world which you you know obviously the, the cobalt uh, which obviously market conditions meant that it made makes sense to park that up and focus on your on your nickel asset. So um, let's do that today. You have just announced some rather good news, haven't you? Yeah. So we've we're placing a strategic um, shareholder in Echo Pro. So Echo Pro is the largest cathode manufacturer in Korea and the second largest in the world. Um, Echo Pro's main customers are Samsung SDI and another group called SK Innovation. So these are two of the biggest battery manufacturing uh, companies in the world. And so we're very, very well positioned now with a $6.8 million investment at a 62% premium to market. And I think that premium just shows that these, um, I suppose, larger um, battery players are focused on a longer term future. and. And this EV revolution isn't slowing, and if anything, it, it could actually be um, heating up even more so as as the economy moves back into sort of stimulus mode. Okay, so obviously six point eight is it's you know it's a nice nice sum of money to get, um, and I want to talk about what you're going to do with that in a second. But a premium like that, what was that conversation like? What what are they buying into? What have you said? Because I think a lot of people need want to know uh, how you go about negotiating. So tell, tell us about it. Yeah, so 
I suppose the, the premium is there because um, we believe that's a suitable premium to bring in a strategic partnership. So the, the partnership is, uh, I suppose, around them potentially over time getting access to the nickel. So um, it's at this stage, it's a fairly, uh, I suppose, early uh, investment for them. It's a small investment. Um, they do end up with a 17% um, shareholding in Blackstone. Um, but we believe that the premium is is fair and reasonable because it's a it's a strategic position that allows them over time they will have access to the metal that they need for the lithium ion battery industry. Well, can we talk about the, the terms around that one? Because that's that's what I was really getting at too. Because you know, what have you had to give away to get a premium like that? Yeah. Because for them, it's not a lot of money. Okay, it really it really isn't a lot of money for you. It's meaningful and it's a step change for you potentially in terms of what you can do to unrelease the potential, you know, in Vietnam, right? So, what have you had to give away? So they they will have a board position. So the Echo Pro will have a um, position on the Blackstone board. So that's one thing we've had to give away. Um, the other condition precedent is we have to exercise the option to uh, own the Tarquin Nickel project. So so we will exercise that option, which is a million dollars worth of Blackstone shares. We will we we'll need to um, give to the vendor. Um, the other thing, I suppose, is that there's a best endeavours um, sort of uh, relationship here where we now move to this next stage, which is the joint venture on the downstream processing facility. So it's not, it's not a formal sort of, um, I suppose, partnership at this stage, but the next stage would be to now move towards this this partnership where we we um, partner on the downstream processing facility, and we both um, then I suppose move to that next stage over the coming six to twelve months. But that's all upside for you, right? I mean, obviously you're able to pay the previous or the current owner of of the asset, giving a board seat away. So what? But you know them. Are you saying, well, we could potentially do something further downstream? That's so that's great for you. You've got a big partner with big pockets, with who are strategic as well as just being, you know, rather than just dumb money, as it were, as I usually call it. Mm. Um, that's great for you. But why have they paid you so much? Do they feel that they've taken up some kind of option? There was there some kind of race going on? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good point. So what they do realise is that they're not the only ones that we're talking to. Um, so we're talking to other Korean players, um, major battery manufacturers. So they realise that they're not the only one in the room here. Um, we're also talking to other, um, I suppose, mining companies as well. So they, we made it fairly clear to them that um, we, we're, we're open to talking to all parties. Uh, and so they... They've jumped first, which is great because they, they're entrepreneurial and they saw the opportunity, but they also realised that they couldn't put any real, um, I suppose, uh, difficult terms around this deal because we would have potentially moved on to the next um, party that we're talking to. So they understand that they're not the only ones and they need to tread carefully um, because we, we've got the metal and the, and the nickel that they, these players need to produce this battery, so yeah, so they they've played it very smartly, and um, and so they now have the jump on on the rest of the the pack, but they're by no means um, the only one that we're going to deal with over time. Okay, cool. That's interesting. So you're saying there's there's no kind of right of first refusal in there. There's no op, you know uh, options on this whatever this downstream deal looks like. That they, they are not. Um, secure in in that sense. All they've done is paid you a premium so that you think that they're a fair partner. But in a commercial world, you've still got choices because there's nothing in, what you're telling me, there's nothing in paper which ties you down to uh, EcoPro moving forward other than they've got 17% of the company. That's quite good. That's right. That's good for shareholders. We're very happy. Um, So that, and and I think the reason we were able to get a, um, a deal like this is because of the fact that there's not many assets like this left around the globe, and um, particularly because our capex um, potential is much lower than our peers, and we talked about this last time. So, so they see this as an opportunity, whereby they have to, yeah, they do have to tread carefully, um, because 
um, we yeah we, we we do have options here, and we have we have an asset that will deliver um, before a lot of our peers. So it's got that ability to produce that nickel that's required in the next two to three years. A lot of our peers will struggle to deliver in that timeline because of the capex hurdles and, and obviously even more so now with the difficult capital market. Yeah, okay, and we'll talk about the asset in a, in a second if you don't mind. Okay, so what's the reaction been like in the market to this announcement and what's the share price done? Uh, yeah, so we went up, um, we're not trading anywhere near the um, issue price of these shares to Echo Pro. So we, I think we've got intraday about 16 cents. These shares will be placed at 17 cents. So. I think it's a, it's a fair reaction. I think um, the market will take some time to digest this. And I'm not sure that the market understands who Echo Pro is. And um, over time, it's not a big name like Samsung or LG, but over time people will do their research and realize that this is one of the major players in the cathode industry in globally. Um, so this is the perfect partner for Blackstone. So yeah, I. I think yeah, we're in a market where you're going to get profit taking and unfortunately we saw a bit of that today but um, we'll see what tomorrow brings. Okay well I guess it's time to you to tell the story right because um, I was the same right you know I was like who's Eco Pro? I just didn't 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 know but you know I think once you know you get some you get some sort of comfort that they will probably if you deliver want to follow their money um, as, you mm-hmm. can, as you say to secure either some kind of offtake agreement or or other uh, agreement. Um, okay, well, let's let's talk about those assets then. Um, you've talked. Okay, you've told us it's got 130 million bucks already sunk into it from you know, previous previous mining operations. Uh, can you just remind people why it shut down and uh, what you're going to be doing going forward? So, it shut down at the bottom of the nickel price. So, eight thousand dollars per ton nickel price when the mine was put into care maintenance. The reason it was put into CAM maintenance was also the fact that they they actually mined the first ore body and depleted it, and they didn't do any exploration outside of that first ore body. So there was no exploration um, conducted by the previous owners. They left behind 25 exploration targets, which we're now moving through, and we've, we've just drilled out the first of those 25 targets. The first target is called the Banfield Disseminated Ore Body, we believe will be a mine for the next 10 to 20 years. And so that's the other reason why we're able to, um, I suppose, entice uh, or attract these um, end users is we've got a mine that justifies a significant investment from the end user because we can deliver the nickel over the, the, the long term. So, which a lot of our peers will have smaller mine lives and, and won't be able to justify building that downstream processing facility, which we'll now look at. Okay, so what I want to talk about is obviously what you're going to be able to do with six point, well, whatever uh, amount of that 6.8 million is going to go in the ground because you've got quite good grades. I mean, you know, over 1% on average uh, across the board with looking at, looking at some of the drill results. So that's pretty good. What you don't have currently is, is a sense of the scale of this, you know, how big this could be. So what are yeah. you going to do with whatever money that you're going to spend from the 6.8? Yeah, so we're still on track for our maiden resource in June, July this year. And then we'll follow that very quickly with our scoping study, which or PEA as they call it in Canada. And that will be the moment where the market realises how much nickel has been left behind mm. and how much uh, or how economic that, that first ore body will be. So they're two key milestones. Um, the $6.8 million will also be used for exploring other ore bodies, but at the same time, we'll also move these studies all the way through to a bankable feasibility study. So with $6.8 million, we're actually funded all the way through to complete a bankable study. Um, our cost profile or cost structure in Vietnam means we can get a lot more done. We're drilling at for $60 a metre versus in Australia that would be 300 or, or, or yeah, in, a, in Canada it was $500 a metre. So we can do a lot more with the $6.8 million in Vietnam than than people with a similar amount would, would need to invest in Australia. And 
So we, we're confident we can get all the way through to a bankable study, and um, and that's uh, that's the old, the idea of this capital injection from EcoPro is they saying, how much do you need to finish your bankable study? Here it is, bang. So, and you, you probably won't answer this, but what, the results will come out in, in, in May, June, July, sometime, right? The, the, um, the scoping study. What do you know today? Are you encouraged by what you see in terms of where this ore body uh, sits? In terms of what do you know about it? What can you tell yeah. us? So what we can say is that, yeah, we, I think we'll go back to your first question, the 1% nickel. We've got a significant amount of this 1% nickel, which is this King Cobra discovery zone. Um, that is twice the grade that we were expecting. So we were happy with anything around 0.5% nickel. Mm. Um, as you know, there's some of our peers that are, are looking to mine even less than that or lower, lower grade. So we've got a significant tonnage at these higher grades. Um, this will deliver a 10 or 20 year mine. So it'll be an economic mine also because we've got the platinum, palladium, gold, rhodium, copper, cobalt. Um, byproduct credits will deliver up to 20% extra revenue uh, on top of the nickel. So there's 80% of the revenue will come from nickel. We've also got all these other metals in there. How, how, how do you know you're going to be able to economically create byproducts with all of those different commodities? Yeah, so we're, we're doing that metallurgical test work now. Um, the previous owners didn't assay for PGEs, so this is a new, a new part of the, the mine that wasn't previously understood. So we're, we're doing that initial work now, but we're confident that those metals will all float into the concentrate. And so you will get, um, you will be able to monetize them. Where, where's the um, confidence, number, where's that confidence come from, Scott? Because obviously many, many companies um, think that until the metallurgy's work is done. So what do you know? Yeah, we've done early stage bench, bench uh, scale test work, yeah. So um, we, we need to do the, the numbers around that. Um, at the moment, we don't know who the customer might be for palladium or rhodium. So there's a bit of work to do, um, but we do know we can recover them. Yeah. Right, okay. So back to the scale question is, you, you what do you know today about where, how far this goes out? I mean, how much drilling, historical drilling data have yeah. you got, for instance? So we've got, I suppose, the things we can talk about are we've got a kilometre long ore body. It's 500 metres wide. Um, there's multiple millions of tonnes. So multiple tens of millions of tonnes um, of economic nickel sulphide um, in the first ore body. So if we were to build a, say, a 2 million tonne per annum concentrator, we might be looking at a, a 10 to 20 year mine life. Um, so, yeah. They're sort of numbers we're looking at. Okay, and um, I know you haven't done the scoping study or, or PEA at, at the moment, but you, you talk about being funded through to BFS. What type of capex numbers would we be talking about? Because again, you've referenced low capex compared to peers who may be talking about you know a billion bucks to kind of get well, dealing yeah. with the last rights, yeah. but so, sulfide projects yep. a little bit cheaper. So, what do you know? Yeah. So what what we can say is that the numbers are still um, looking uh, very competitive, uh, circa $100 million US or, uh, for a downstream processing facility. Um, we still would need to um, upgrade the concentrator, so there's, a, there's, there's another capital spend there which we're still um, doing the work on, but I'm confident we'll land below, say, $200 million total. Um, so, yeah, we're still... 20% of, of a, of a HPAL scenario. So, yeah, we're, we're aiming for that 10 to 20% um, compared to that billion dollar HPAL plant, which is our, our main competitor. Right. No, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's very, very different. I think we've done enough, you know, interviews with people talking about the difference between last rights and sulfides or bodies. So, um, so 200 million market cap. Again, where would you, where would you, I mean, because you're going to talk about getting into production in the next two to three years, right? That's pretty quick in the, in the mm. scheme of things. Unfortunately, I've now signed up Echo Pro and they're not going to accept anything less. And uh, 
and they're going to keep me accountable to that. And that's fine because my background being a mining engineer, I'm, I'm happy to, to go forward with this. And, and the good thing is now we've got the um, funding partner, so that won't be the bottleneck. So going forward, funding won't be the bottleneck. Um, we, we obviously need to push very quickly through these studies and, and obviously we don't want to be cutting corners on, on any of that, um, drilling and, and metallurgy. And so there's a lot of study work, but there's still, there's still 12, 18 months of studies here. And then we can build in 2022 and mining in 2023. So that's, Echo Pro will keep me accountable to that. And, and I'm happy because as long as they keep funding it, I can deliver that. Well, fantastic. If they, if they keep funding it, great, happy days. You can focus on running the business, not running around the world chasing money, right? So that, that's, well, not, not that we can at the moment, but yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so if, if, I, if I look at this project, I, I need to understand it from an investment perspective, okay? That's what people watching here are trying to work out is like, what am I buying into? So you're saying it's a, it's a quick to production, low capex, high grade nickel project. Obviously, you've seen a bump in the shares uh, today. Hasn't really done much prior to that because you've been working out what what you're um, trying to be and what you're trying to focus on, what you're trying to do. What can shareholders look forward to this year or even next year in terms of catalyst, proper catalyst moments? Because I think you know yeah. drill results come and go and no one cares, right? But what yeah. are you going to be able to tell people which is going to significantly move this company along? What are those big moments? Yeah, I, I think the first one will be that maiden resource. So we can really wrap some numbers around the resource, tons and grade, and, and you'll see the grade of these other uh, byproducts as well. So that'll be June, July. And then the scoping study is probably the biggest milestone because that's when we start to put MPVs around this. So I've obviously talked about CapEx, but... We're, we're obviously aiming for MPVs that are multiples of our CapEx number. And so there'll be a moment here when people realise that the market cap, whatever it is, 20 or 30, we're talking multiple $100 million of MPV here. So that's the moment where the market goes, okay, so there's an MPV of that. They've got the funding partner. Um, there's already been a mine built there before, so there'll be a mine there again. It has to sink in eventually. Um, so yeah, the key milestones will be the scoping study, main resource, moving through these studies. That's when the institutional investors have to come in and say, well, hang on, this is going to be a mine again. So yeah, I think it's it's when we wrap the numbers around it. I mean, and, uh, and obviously it's very difficult to do that until we do the formal job process and all that. So um, yeah, that'll come. No, okay, you've got, a, you've got a lot of the right parts there. I mean, I guess the big one that people are looking at, obviously the fact that you've got a partner, are you going to be brave enough to say you're fully funded through to um, production? The conversations we're having is that they still want us to bring our own capital. Okay. And the reason why is that they don't want to be left holding the baby. And, the, and there's a great story, and it's the Amber Toby mine in Madagascar where Korea... Blew, the, blew themselves up and Korea learned the hard way. They don't want to be hold, left, in the, left holding the baby here and so they do want us to bring our own capital to the table. Um, but you could almost say we're fully funded because within Korea, I think we can bring all that capital to the table. And and so we'll, we'll start working with other players as well here. So yeah, we're, we're close, but we, we will still need conventional capital markets. At some stage. Okay. Which you expect to get from Korea or elsewhere in the world? Well, there are pockets of money out there and, and they are harder to find that can invest in this type of opportunity. And so we're hunting those down at the moment. Um, we, there's a chance that we could fund this almost entirely through Korean money, um, but that's not a good strategy either. We need to expand and, and, and look at all the options. Yeah, I think you, as you referred earlier, it, your optionality around the funding is important to you in terms of negotiation or else you'll find your money all of a sudden gets quite expensive if you're reliant on one partner. So I think I think that's, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, so lots, lots of good stuff there, Scott. Um, 
appreciate you coming on and telling us all about it. Obviously, you've moved things significantly from even from November to today. It's only four four short months. Well, actually, I feel like very long weeks at the moment with this confinement. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, I look forward to hearing about the scoping study and any of these other results as they come through. But you, you you've identified quite a good asset there. Um, I hope you hope you can get all the way through to this uh, BFS quickly. What's your timing on that, actually, the BFS? So, twelve to eighteen months from now, I think we can deliver that. Mm. Um, so, scoping studies um, as soon as we can. So, sort of August, um, September, PFS soon after. The conversion from scoping to PFS will, will be fairly quick because most of our we're hoping that. The most of our resource will be in that um, indicated category so we can convert to PFS quickly. There is a lot of work to get into that bankable stage, which is pilot plants. And, yeah. and so that's a 12 to 18 month process. Actually, that's, that, you raised an interesting point before, before we go is, uh, would um, EcoPro fund any pilot or demonstration plants or is that gonna be part of the larger funding? Yeah, so we, by that stage, we probably would have, um, I suppose, built our partnership to a formal, um, like a SPV type scenario where we would actually fund that together. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, enough said, Scott. Um, appreciate your time. I know it's, you know, getting late there, time for a beer, I suspect. So uh, I'll let you go and do that. Stay in touch and uh, give us a call. No worries, thanks.